he literally heard a voice in his head that said, it's time to tell JR about Jesus. And he was like, that's crazy. Because he's JR. <laughs> <laughs> I was just staring up at the stars and I was like, all right, God, if you want to say something, I'm here. Here I am. I'm listening. Clear as anything I've ever heard, the Holy Spirit said, I've given you this message about becoming fear-proof, and it's going to start with you facing your own. This dog lunged up, hit me in the face, took a big chunk out of the lower section, but I knew exactly how to process that information so that I never was able to develop the fear of dogs. But it's so crazy because I can recognize, man, if I didn't know what to do with an experience like that, mm -hmm. I totally would have created a, a narrative that dogs are very dangerous. Our goal is to help people recognize they have authority over the stories they tell themselves. And if the story you're telling yourself isn't benefiting you, change the story. And welcome back, folks, Chris and Sarah, and our guest, uh, my longtime friend, J.R. Covey, here to join us the Zen Meathead podcast. Yes, welcome to the show. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. It's thank an you honor. for being here. Um, as always, we're trying to elevate humanity one conversation at a time. And uh, you've listened to some of the podcasts. Mm -hmm. uh, we spoke, I guess, probably at the beginning of the podcast about the idea. Didn't make it happen then. And ironically, just recently, in some of my own self-evolution and research, I dug to a root problem. And uh, ironically, it made me think of you. The word of the day is fear. Mm -hmm. I had no fucking idea until I started journaling and meditating, like, how much fear drives my life. Yeah. And with you, uh, it sounds like you also had uh, quite an experience in your life and quite a transformation. Yeah. Um, and you come to be quite a specialist on fear. As I understand, your company's name is Fear Proof Me. Yes, so absolutely. Tell us a little bit more. Um, well, let's just kind of maybe start at the beginning. How did, yeah. you know, you and I met in high school in Anacortes our freshman year. We yeah. were um, very different people at the time. We. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not where is, used is to the be. word troublemaker? Well, so JR's trouble finder. JR's such an understatement. <laughs> his dad was the mayor in town. My dad was the right. chief of police in town. Yeah. And yeah. we were the untouchables. Yeah. Well, we were just shitheads. <laughs> we were troublemakers. Yeah. No, absolutely. I I took full advantage of that in so many wrong ways. You know, obviously, we, we have a sordid history together. We've both grown up quite a bit. Uh, tell me a little bit about how you went from uh, you and I uh, sneaking off to smoke cigarettes, drink beer, and other things that we won't talk about, to uh, <laughs> where you are today. What did, what did that evolution look like? Yeah, one that I never saw coming. I uh, wasn't looking for a transformation. I thought I had everything figured out. I was making good money. I was living in Kirkland. I thought uh, working... At the time, people said, you work for the devil, and I said, yeah, but it pays really well. <laughs> said because that before. I was, I was a commercial emailer. I was a spammer at the beginning of spam, and there was so much money to be made, and it was ridiculous. It was a bunch of 20-something guys who were making money hand over fist, and we partied like rock stars and drank and smoked and snorted everything we could get our hands on, and then <laughs> took six vacations a year and partied with all kinds of unsavory people, and... Literally, because that was my entry into adulthood, I thought, this is what adulthood is. You've arrived. Yeah, I <laughs> figured it out. And uh, then 9-11 happened, and venture capital stopped getting thrown at every single young guy that had an idea. And we were the ones who were just vacuuming up all of the VC, all of these new business ideas that wanted to do something. We were like, hey, commercial email, that's the way to do it. Here we are. And... Uh, so I had made a lot of money and lost a lot of money and realized that neither of those scenarios really got me to a place where I felt content and fulfilled and happy and just constantly chasing after the next thing. And my best friend at the time, whose nickname is Tattoo Joe. <laughs> I've heard stories. Because about 70% of his body's covered in ink. He did my tattoos. He was a former tattoo artist. Uh, not afraid of anything. He was EOD in the Navy, which is explosive ordnance disposal. So these are guys whose job it is to pull landmines off of, or like mines off of the bottom of boats going through the Suez Canal. Like they're crazy. And you can't have a normally functioning self preservation brain and take that job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to be willing to do what's absolutely insane. And so this is a guy who we, we literally became friends because we were 
very good pool players, and we realized that if we play against each other, then one of us is going to get bumped off a table and have to wait, but if we play at tables next to each other, we can run a table all night long. And so he and I would go to the same bars, and we would just find two tables next to each other, and we would use our pool playing as an excuse for alcoholism. <laughs> Been there. You get really good at something when you're doing it seven days a week. Like, even if you're drunk when you're doing it, yeah. you get that much practice, you get pretty good at it. Mm-hmm. And the aiming and, fluid helps. Yeah, it really <laughs> it felt like it did. Mm-hmm. And uh, so one night, before he came down to the bar, and we were literally at the bar every night, and if, if I was not at the bar for more than, like, two nights in a row, people would start to wonder, like, is he okay? Like, what happened? Did he go on vacation? Did he do a wellness check? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so, something's wrong. And that night, he literally heard a voice in his head that said, it's time to tell JR about Jesus. And I had no faith background whatsoever. I'd been in churches probably half a dozen times in my life. Every single one of those was a wedding or a funeral. No frame of reference for even the concept of faith. And uh, he did, but then had a very troubled youth and walked away and had no, was not working on that area of his life. But he just felt there was this inner witness that it's time to tell JR about Jesus. And he was like, that's crazy. Because he's JR. <laughs> <laughs> And I keep my, I, I still have my ID that shows what I look like. I literally look like I just got out of a skinhead rally. Like I was bald and had a big burly goatee and wanted to look mean and scary and had gotten into slinging because I was entrepreneurial enough to realize that I didn't want to pay retail value for my drug habit. So if I just buy a bunch and then sell it to all of the other Bellevue kids, then mine is hey, free. Or, yeah. Exactly, yeah, or at mm-hmm. least cheap. I don't know if I ever got to break even, but it was at least less expensive. <laughs> Wasn't a profitable venture. Mm-hmm. But, uh, like one. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of bad drug dealers around. <laughs> what you're talking about. And uh, so Joe comes down to the bar one night and he was like, hey, you know, I gotta ask you, if you could have anything in the world, what would it be? And I didn't even think about it. I said, inner peace. Mm-hmm. And then I stopped and thought, what kind of a stupid chick answer is that? <laughs> that sounds like Miss America. Uh, actually, yeah, you know? I, I would I would take inner peace over anything. And I know that sounds really lame, but that's what I want. And Joe's like, well, what's the worst thing that could happen if you invite Jesus Christ into your heart? How bad could it go from here? And I was floored. It's the most ridiculous, ridiculous show. Wait a minute. And we're in a bar, and I'm got a captain in Coco. What? Where did that come from? And he goes, no, seriously, just throwing it out there. What's the worst thing that could happen? Are you afraid you're going to like it? And the crazy thing is... I had been to a church because I was living with a girl for years who every weekend she would say the same thing. I want to go to church. I want to go to church. And I would respond the same way every time. Fine, go. I don't care. I'm mm-hmm. not going. But I remember every time I went, just crossing the threshold, stepping inside that church specifically, felt different. And it wasn't a warm, fuzzy, loving feeling. It was, this creeps me the hell out. <laughs> But it was there was something that was because it didn't make sense that I should feel a thing. This was a door in a building. Like there's no reason for me to feel an emotional experience. And so she got me to go several times way before I ever got saved. And then that night I knew, you know what? I got to go to that place because whatever it was, it was real. Like it, honestly, I didn't wasn't happy or fun, but it was real. And so I got to go see. I got to at least figure this out. I got to go see where this goes. And so I did. I called the church the next day and I said, you know, I. I know it's kind of random, but is is there somebody there whose job it is to show me how to do this Christian thing? Because like I don't know what Christians do, <laughs> yeah. or where Christians work. go, or yeah, what yeah, Christians but... talk about. Like I literally have no idea what this is. And she started to laugh. She was like, "Yes, well, yes, for sure." And so she just grabbed a male leader who didn't. She didn't obviously know my story. Didn't know his story even. Guy in my age group connects him to me. He calls me. He had gotten saved in a bar three years earlier. Yeah. <laughs> and so. He walked me through those first couple months because I was stumbling forward and I'd call him at 3 o'clock in the morning like, Chris, I did it again. But I'm drinking and I know better. (laughs) And he would say, buddy, the problem isn't that you stumbled. The problem is when you stop making the call that you want to be better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a verse in the Bible that says a righteous man falls seven times but he gets back up again because the nature of righteousness isn't in the not falling. It was never my righteousness to begin with. Christ paid the price, and I get that. Now, all I've got to do is walk it out. And I'm never going to be perfect. My goal is just to stumble forward. Yeah. <laughs> fall and get back up again. And fall again. 
So all of that happens. In the process of going to church, I meet my wife, who I was, until we got married, convinced was literally perfect, angel, in every way, completely flawless. And then within weeks, discovered she was human also. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> when, uh, when rage out of this tiny, petite, cute little thing was just something I'd never experienced. When we started going to counseling, we discovered that from her incredibly traumatic childhood, she had never been convinced that there was a person who wasn't going to leave her. Yep. And I was the first person that she was comfortable recognizing he's not going anywhere so I can show him who I am. And so the counselor was like, well, the good news is <laughs> you're the first safe person in her life. And I was like, yeah, but I didn't sign up for that. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> and so, but I made the decision that I wasn't, I was in this no matter what. It didn't matter. If I, I had resigned myself, honestly, because the first many years of our marriage were brutal. It was rough. But I knew I wasn't going anywhere. We were going to get through this. Whatever it took. If, I, if, if the next 50 years of my life were going to suck, I wasn't going anywhere. I was, I was going to see this thing through. And the crazy thing is now, I seriously think my wife and I have the best marriage of anyone I know. I don't know. <laughs> we, might, we might put you to the that's, test. That's the cool thing, because he celebrated you the minute I said that. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that, yeah, we did have to go through some real pain, some real ugly, horrible times. But it's so worth it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and we called it uh, paving over the escape hatch. <laughs> like, all right, there's no more if this doesn't work. There's no more what happens if we have to split. It was like, nope, it's not an option. Like, We're not splitting. Right. Yeah, and like it was said. actually in the middle of one of the worst crises that we ever had. Or, I mean, up to this point. But, <laughs> we've, you know, we've had many. Knock on <laughs> some. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, so in the process of that, we discovered that she had post-traumatic stress disorder. She mm -hmm. was raised in a very violent home. Her, they fled Ukraine in the middle of the night, her mom and her two sisters. Mm -hmm. And honestly, they fled communism just as they, much as they fled her incredibly violent father. And mom and, two, and the three girls, her and her two sisters, fled in the middle of the night, came to America, and then my wife was sexually abused for many years. And her high school years was suicidal, like hated life, didn't think there was any purpose in living, but she had a faith that told her, if I kill myself, I go to hell, so I can't do that. So she had just come to this place where she's like, well, I can't commit suicide, but there's literally nothing living for. Resignation. And in the process of us getting together and we start doing this research, I realized that she was having these fear responses to stuff that just did not make sense. Like, how could a person have a fear reaction to a thing like that? And the, the one story that I share all the time is, and I had become used to it, if there was a thump that she couldn't immediately recognize the source of, and we were at home, she would snap. Mm -hmm. Full on, flip out, fight or flight, survival mechanism. Fine, I'm leaving you. And I'd be like, okay, we don't have to eat spaghetti. Like, I don't know what's going <laughs> right. talking about dinner. And then we were at my brother's house one night. And there was a thud that happened upstairs at his house. And in me, it triggered a fear response. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh God, she's gonna snap right here in front of everybody. And she didn't. And then it sent me on this journey of like, wait a minute, now why, why does it happen sometimes? Why doesn't it happen sometimes? And starting to look at it. And I did a really deep dive into what does the Bible have to say about fear and anxiety and, and your thought processes and your expectations. And in the process of doing that, we just started teaching a Bible study and we didn't have any wisdom of our own. We just said, this is what the Bible says about fear. And so we taught that for probably three years. And in the middle of the night, I was woken up and it's weird because I don't wake up easy. So I knew this had to be different because I was wide awake at three o'clock in the morning. And I went and I was, it was a really nice summer night. I went and laid on a hammock on the back porch and I was just staring up at the stars. And I was like, all right, God, if you want to say something, I'm here. Here I am, I'm listening. And clear as anything I've ever heard, Holy Spirit said, I've given you this message about becoming fear-proof, and it's going to start with you facing your own. Oh, I just got chills. Oh. Oh. Yeah, goosebumps. <clears throat> oh, okay. Damn it. Yeah. And the crazy thing is, he didn't have to say anything else because I knew exactly what that meant. I know my core fear is insecurity. I don't want to be judged. You can give me snakes, spiders, guns, Fist like stuff. That any, yeah, I'm not afraid of a fight. I'm not afraid of it. 
giving somebody a chance to judge me as being inadequate is terrifying. You can put me in front of 10,000 people and give me a microphone, I'm fine with that. Yep. But do not give somebody a chance to judge me. Here's your report card. Yeah. Check. Oh. <laughs> and so I did. I went back and I got my degree in counseling psychology from Northwest University, graduated summa cum laude. I had no idea that I could be successful in school because mm -hmm. I did not go to school the first time around at all. <laughs> I was never good at school. And I just wrote it off that school's not for me. It's just, it's for somebody else. But in the process of going back to school and getting my degree, I realized that everything that we had been teaching that were biblical truths is completely supported by evidence-based science. It just uses different terms. Mm -hmm. And so we were telling people, okay, well, the Bible says take every thought captive and make it subject to the mind of Christ, which is a foreign term, to, a foreign concept to a lot of people, but science calls it metacognition, which mm -hmm. is just thinking about your thinking, which is something that people don't naturally do until somebody says, hey, you can do this. Mm -hmm. You can have a thought, stop, reject that thought, and then create a new thought. Yeah. <laughs> Just because you thought a thing doesn't mean it's concrete reality and you have to enmesh with it and own it and accept it and believe it and then react from it. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we got to the place where we've been teaching Fear Proof now for over eight years. We've taught it in, in Eastern Europe and we've taught it here. We've done a lot of work with an organization that rescues girls out of human trafficking, obviously, because my wife's Ukrainian. We've been, we spent time in Greece and Bulgaria and Romania and Moldova and Ukraine. Wow. Yeah. And so our goal is to help people recognize they have authority over the stories they tell themselves. And if the story you're telling yourself isn't benefiting you, change the story. Yeah. Why are you doing it? <laughs> yeah. And it's, it, it's crazy to me. And, you know, we're the same age, 44, mm -hmm. 45, something like that. I mean, you're, you're close by a little bit older. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cougar. Cougar. Um, so one, I don't think a lot of people, um, uh, have spent the time to really sit down and consider what it is that they're afraid of. Yeah. Um, and or even how they think really. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing to me, um, what brought up this conversation and me becoming aware of, you know, sure. I have standard human fear. Like I don't want to be eaten by a large cat or <laughs> shot down or any of these things. And quite frankly, I don't want any, I was like you, I wanted to be giant and huge because people would just leave me alone. Then, <laughs> which is, which is wonderful. Uh, but some people don't have that luxury, but I, I started to recognize something very interested, interesting in the masculine space mm -hmm. around fear. So I started one of our previous, uh, yeah, wow. Guests. Guests. There we go. Lori, uh, life coach. I'm actually running through a program right now. And what? You know, I've got to do meditation every day. I've got to write every day. So through this writing, um, you know, these patterns started to emerge. Mm -hmm. And what I look at a cute little wheel that shows me all the emotions. There's this like three quarters of the pie that starts down low with like anger and all these things. And everything underneath it was like... Yeah insecurity, being let down, uncomfortable, all of these things uh, occur through me generally as anger. Mm -hmm. And with all of my work in the men's groups, I started to recognize a huge pattern. Like most men have a very limited palette of um, emotional expression for things that are, let's say, negative type connotations. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, even love can be uncomfortable if you are not comfortable with it. So even a positive emotion can evince a negative reaction. Yeah. If you're not like able to deal with it, so it's not even negative. It's just something that's uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. And then learning to to sit with that, mm -hmm. the fear, as it were. Now I know when we spoke on the phone, um, you had mentioned through all of your clinical work. Now you had a similar experience where you know we talk about uh, men and even. So with women, uh, you've obviously worked quite a bit. Oh, yeah. um, is there a common thread? You know, men, it tends to be, when you dig down at the root of it, it seems to be fear, insecurity, these yeah. kinds of things. Um, have you recognized a pattern with women? In 100%. Mm -hmm. So the, the most common, if you, if you lump fears together, and it depends on the research, Ooh. some people say Can I take this. a guess? <laughs> I don't mean to interrupt you. No, for sure. But I, I bet it's safety. So, so it's very closely related, yeah. Mm -hmm. So... The, uh, depending on the research, like I said, there's somewhere between one and seven core fears, depending on how they parse it out. I think it's somewhere between four and five. The most common one that we see in men has to do with insecurity and value. 
and the one that we see most common with women is rejection, abandonment, isolation, and w along with that, mm -hmm. I'm alone and I'm unsafe. Yep. And we were made for a relationship. We were made, and all of us were, but specifically women have have, especially women who have been sexually abused, physically abused, emotionally abused by men. The problem is the amygdala and the emotional memory of the brain attaches every single emotional experience memory that you have literally from before you have words to define it and some research would even suggest in utero that people can develop fears around specific stimuli mm -hmm. now the crazy thing is the amygdala doesn't store the chronological data point with that memory so something that happened to you two days ago and something that happened when you were two are just as relevant in engaging the amygdala because until you train it to not expect that thing to be dangerous, it will continue to expect that thing to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so in my wife's case, she grew up in a household where if there was a thud in another room, it was dad beating someone, yeah. beating mom, beating one of the other sisters. Somebody could literally die. And... So when we were at home, she would have those fear reactions, but not being at home at my brother's house, she didn't have it because that being at home was a key component to her amygdala saying, this isn't safe. Mm -hmm. I need to run. I need to get out. And when we started to realize that the amygdala is just trying to find sufficiently similar evidence to justify engaging. Mm -hmm. if, this, if this situation has enough criteria that attach to a traumatic experience or tr even just a traumatic expectation, then boom, we engage and it's not dysfunction, it's self-preservation. Yeah. It's Actually, working perfectly. <laughs> exactly, I had a great conversation with a, a doctor at, at University of Washington who's literally trying to push the changing the name for post-traumatic stress disorder because technically for something to be a disorder, it has to be the brain malfunctioning. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's not. It's the brain functioning perfectly based on the information that brain has been given. And anybody else given that information would come to the same conclusion. Yeah. When a car backfires and a veteran hits the ground because they think it's gunfire, that's their brain doing what their brain needs to do to keep them safe. Mm -hmm. That's not malfunction. Yeah. But the crazy thing is we've realized um, extinction is a process that psychology has known about and, and spoken about for 100 years, mm -hmm. many, many decades. If you give your brain enough new data to recognize that an experience should no longer be an expectation, you can retrain the amygdala. If you have one experience with a dog and you get bitten, then 100% of your dog experiences are getting bitten. You will experience, expect that. You give your brain 99 more experiences where you don't get bitten, there comes a point where the brain adapts and says, you know what, that should be considered an outlier, not an expectation. So we help people actually deconstruct the aspects of their experiences and the memories. And the crazy thing is even just lessons. People can adapt fears from stuff that they've never seen and never experienced. And the just most obvious one is everyone I know has a healthy reverential fear of sharks, but not many of them have actually been bitten by a shark. Guilty as charged. <laughs> oh. And so you don't even have to have had a traumatic experience. And so sometimes people will adopt a fear, oftentimes from family of origin, from a caregiver, something that happened to your grandparents, something that happened to your parent, an aunt, an uncle, or whatever, and you've just sufficiently assumed there is such a bad outcome related to this experience that I need to be afraid of it too. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned sharks because I took him diving in Jamaica. That's awesome. And uh, we're 100 feet down, and here's this reef shark, like six-foot reef shark, hanging out, just having a good old time, just chilling. And the dive instructor does this thing. He's like, and, and I'm like, oh, okay. So I go over, and I start petting the shark. And uh, he points to Chris, and Chris is like, uh, nope, oh, I'm all no, good, thanks. No. But then we come to talk about it, and he's like, I I honestly believed that they were, like, just these, like, Rabbit zombies. dogs of the ocean. That, like, no matter what happened, if you were in their presence, they were going to attack you. And I was like, no, they're more like dogs. If they've had a bad experience or they're somehow incited into it, 100% they'll mess you up. But otherwise, they don't want anything to do with you. And it just, like, to see it dawn on him where it was like, oh, huh. Yeah, I, I always assumed if you got into the water that had sharks, you were uh, you were taking a big fat risk. Yeah. You were bait. Yeah, pretty much.
I think it's funny that I also had a crazy experience, but it would happen after I'd been teaching this. So you can see I have a scar just mm -hmm. below my eye. Yep. So I had a German Shepherd that took a chunk out of my lower jaw, and then I almost lost my vision because the upper teeth hit right on the edge of the orbital bone. Oof. And so this dog lunged up, hit me in the face, took a big chunk out of the lower section. And I remember knowing exactly what to do in the days following that experience where I recognized that dog was protecting its owner. Yeah. That dog, and it was honestly, it was my brother's dog. Mm -hmm. But the dog, but I don't go up to see him often enough, apparently that's on me. I didn't teach the dog I'm friendly. Mm -hmm. But my stepbrother's a foot shorter than I am. So somebody he didn't know walked into the house and then just mauled the owner by me throwing my arms around him to give him a big hug. And mm -hmm. then the dog's like, oh, hell no. Not in my <laughs> house. <laughs> That's my owner right there. <laughs> yeah. But I remember I felt the tingling up and down the spine the next time I saw the dog. Like, but I knew exactly how to process that information so that I never was able to develop the fear of dogs. But it's so crazy because I can recognize, man, if I didn't know what to do with an experience like that, mm -hmm. I totally would have created a, a narrative that dogs are very dangerous. Yeah. As many people have. Yeah. So um, you and your wife get together uh, through uh, a discovery of faith. Uh, you end up teaching some Bible study classes, uh, trying to... Um, break down and figure out uh, what's going on with your wife and trying to help her evolve through this um, kind of was the beginning and the blossoming of the development of this program that you've created and, and, and your school uh, work, obviously. Um, so you launch fearproof.me. That's the website, correct? Yeah. Fearproof.me. So by all means, people go and check it out. It's, I'm, I'm going to talk with you about it as well because it's something <laughs> I'm interested in. Um, now, from a format standpoint, like, is it still uh, a church-related event? Is it a completely separate uh, program and entity that you, like, teach worldwide? Yeah. Like, so we, te we teach online classes. Yep. It's a six-week, technically now, it's a six-week cognitive behavioral group therapy curriculum. Mm -hmm. We okay. still talk about where we get this wisdom. We talk, we quote the Bible, we reference, this is where these beliefs come from. It is an appeal to authority, if you think about an argument, but the people who are coming to this, that's the ultimate authority. And so, I, me giving somebody who's Christian a whole bunch of scientific jargon that doesn't help them associate and relate to it isn't going to benefit them. And at the end of the day, I want people to be better. I don't care. I quote all kinds of ancient historians throughout. I love quotes. So every single time we get together, I quote Sophocles and Aristotle and all kinds of people throughout the curriculum. So it's not a thing that people who think, oh, I don't have that same faith. I need to not do that. Shouldn't be afraid. Well, that's, that's kind of what I wanted because I, you know, you know me. And in fact, uh, you watch me go through some stuff in social media. Um, <laughs> I've, I've had a, a specific opinion of religion, which I'm trying to reframe. I think some of it had to do with my upbringing. Um, and you've had quite a profound uh, change in my mind of that. Um, one, seeing you go from, you know, who we were back in the day <laughs> to, to who you are now, um, as well as the fact, you know, when you started to break down of like, hey, you know, Tattoo Joe was telling me this stuff, which I immediately would take umbrage with in that moment. But, you know, again, my close buddy is bringing this to me. Like, what do you have to lose? Like, I see the appeal in that. You also talk about the fact that, you know, take whatever Bible verse you want. And it's like, here's what they're saying in scientific terms. Like, why do I care where the message is coming from if the, the teaching is, is prudent and, and worthwhile to my quality of life improvement? Um, so, yeah, I, I brought that up just because I, I know I have uh, we have guests that, you know, uh, Run the super or, yeah all over sure. uh, super anti-religious folks as well and I want to make sure that folks don't get turned off simply by virtue of that it's sort of like cool. hey like the meaning's still there the people who are strongly anti-religion are more like me than they are dissimilar which is funny and that's the thing that I never knew you don't realize I know I have more in common with every other person on earth the people who are as opposed to me and opposite me that you could imagine than I have different. Yeah. I've come from traveling and, and my experiences with people around the world and seeing cultures, and I realize we are all way more alike yeah. than we are different. Yeah. And I had, I'll share a crazy experience. We were in uh, a little tiny gypsy village in Bulgaria, and there was half of the village that the aid people were allowed to go, and then there was the half you weren't. Mm -hmm. And we knew where we weren't supposed to go. And I'm with our, our contact there. And Soya doesn't care. Like she is fearless. She is. 
she grew up in the gypsy villages, like doesn't nothing bothers her. Now, I'm not officially a security person on a detail at this moment, but I am huge and I'm with two girls. Yeah. So I kind of have my head on a swivel. I'm in my normal security mode as we're walking around. And a little girl comes running over and says, oh, hey, the baby was born. And so Soyanka's like, hey, come on, let's go. We got to go see the baby. And I'm like, wait a minute. This is the line you don't cross. <laughs> like, yeah. I know better. And I can't, I, like, how am I supposed to take these two girls? And she's not paying attention to me at all. <laughs> so I was like, all right, let's go. There's a baby to go see. I'm like, all right, let's go. And so as we're walking through, and, and it's not, like, I say the word village, but most people would never guess. Well, let up see is as shoddy a hovel as you could imagine. These are tin corrugated roofs and bricks that were stolen from job sites and things that are slapped together. These are, most of them don't have electricity. None of them have running water. I mean, it's a, it was literally built inside the dump. Abject poverty. And so as we're walking through, she points to this literally stack of bricks with a roof on it. And she goes, oh, that's the house for the local gun runner drug lord guy. But he's not home. And I'm like, oh. Good. That's, <laughs> That's comforting. So reassuring. And she goes, it's okay. His daughter loves me. We're fine. And so I'm like, all right. So now adrenaline's going. I'm like, all right, we're walking farther and farther past that line. I know we're not supposed to be here. We get over there. And mom is probably 12. Oh, Dad's probably in his 40s. Mm. Kids are running around naked in the dirt. <sighs> There's no hope for these people like this it's unbelievable and we're standing there for a couple minutes and i'm again head on a swivel looking around and a car comes around the corner probably 50 60 yards away and strunka goes oh that's the guy i told you about and immediately i go into war gaming this scenario mm -hmm. what are my exit strategies is there an improvised weapon nearby i see there's only one person Don't in the car out. so i'm not outnumbered mm -hmm. Like, I'm literally, how do I get these girls out of here? How do we survive this scenario? Yeah. Adrenaline through the roof. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting my oxygenation. I'm like, okay, calm the heart rate down. Think yeah. clearly. Like, let's do this. Like, I'm ready to throw down with gun running drug lord. And he pulls up another, like, I don't know, maybe a little more than halfway. So he's probably like 20 yards away. And he stops again. And he's sitting there smoking his cigarette, just staring at us. We obviously aren't gypsies. We don't fit in. Wait, what? I, I am not a local here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so he, he's just sitting there staring at us. And Strong is like, oh, I'll just go up and talk to him. And so she goes over and she talks to him for a little bit. I have no idea what they said. So and he decides to pull his car up. And she was like, let me introduce you. And, and he goes to open the door. And for whatever reason, my reaction was just to reach out with a smile and a handshake. And the second my hand made contact with him, Everything in me knew if I was born in this guy's life, I'd have been him. No question. Yeah. I absolutely would have been the gun-running drug lord. Mm -hmm. There's no difference between me and this guy other than where I was born. Yep. I absolutely would have done what it took to feed my family, to take care of my own, screw the rest of the world. And I, and I had no fear. I had no judgment over this guy. Mm -hmm. I wasn't worried about how it was going to go down. And I wish I could say, like, it was this wonderful, happy scenario, and he accepted Jesus. Yeah, no, none of that happened. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he ever cracked a smile. He talked to her. He did shake my hand. He got out of the car. He got back in. But something in my heart changed the minute I knew there was literally no difference between me and this guy. Mm -hmm. And I was not afraid of him. I wasn't judging him. I didn't look down on him anymore. He was a dude born into a really rough scenario, and he's doing what he has to do to get by. Yeah. And it totally changed the way we did ministry and the way we did outreach and the way we interacted with people. And it, and it, it literally marked the way I see people. And so people who, are, who hate me, who think I'm crazy, who oppose everything I stand for, we're still way more alike than we are different. They just don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, and one of the things that I've really been uh, paying attention to lately is um, how we have different names for the same thing. Or similar things and so you know I a lot of my family members are um, devoutly religious and and take it very seriously and I am NOT one of those people um, never have been I, I like to poke holes in, in theories and I like to find problems with arguments and all the different things but one of the things that I realized was like all of this energetic stuff all of this higher power 
you know, source energy, whatever it is, it's all us trying to figure out how to maneuver through the same stuff in the same way. We just call it different things. And we have different rules based on where we came from, but like being able to find that common ground with people and having a religious conversation with my sister for the first time in ever and just really saying like, okay, like, tell me about it. I want to hear more. Um, and being open to that, man, it creates such cool, cool experiences. For sure. Yeah. And it, it finds common ground where there wasn't some before. Yeah. And I think if we can find even little ways to agree, even if we can't agree on the big things, the deal breaker things, like I'm never going to waver on Jesus Christ is the son of God. He did what he did. He paid the price. My life is transformed as evidence of it. I think the fact that I am where I am and doing what I do is just as big a miracle as the seas parting in the Old Testament. Like, there was no reason for my life to turn around. It didn't turn around because I was good enough. It didn't turn around because I was smart enough. It didn't turn around because didn't earn I it. earned it. Yeah. It turned around because God got a hold of me and turned me around. But if I can get somebody that doesn't have to agree with everything I say, but we can find something to work towards, let's make, let's make people better. Let's help people. Yeah. Let's make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. And I believe because of what, what my faith says, like God's going to get a hold of you. If you want, if you want to seek after God and you say, okay, God, show me that you're real. He'll do that. But that's between you and him. I'm not on that. I don't have to talk anybody into it because if I can talk somebody into it, somebody else can talk them out of it. Exactly. I have no value in bringing some kind of convincing argument to the table to outwit somebody or convince them of a thing. Mm -hmm. God got a hold of me, not because I was smart enough or good enough or strong enough, because he loved me. Mm -hmm. I didn't earn that. Yeah, and it's interesting you say the word faith because coming from his background, which I'm sure is similar to yours, there is a real shoehorn about faith and the implications that it has for people. And one of the things that we've been talking about quite a bit is you have to have faith in this process. You have to believe. And it's really hard. And the first thing that you think is, well, as soon as you explain it to me, I'll believe. And the answer is the opposite. As soon as you believe, I'll explain it to you. Yeah. And so it's amazing how similar it is where I'm like, honey, you just got to have faith, man. You got to, you got to like, just got to believe it. And he's like, I, <laughs> I love that conversation because everybody is a person of faith, mm -hmm. whether they admit it or not. You have faith in something. Exactly. I had faith this chair was going to hold me when I sat in it because I've sat in chairs that didn't. <laughs> Big <deal. laughs> And so there are chairs I will not put my faith in. <laughs> I will stand. <laughs> I've gone to two, the last two parent-teacher conferences, and the teacher's like, please, go ahead and sit. And I was like, thank you. I will stand. I'm good. <laughs> I'll take a knee if you want me to. I'll get down on your left. Like, just, I'm, I will. That, that was built for a six-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> not a six-year-old. I'm not here to break your things. And uh, it's very similar with fear. People think, oh, I don't, I don't have fear. But the definition that I've given it is fear is the expectation of a negative outcome. Mm -hmm. And it's that simple. You go into a situation with the expectation of a negative outcome, you're going to be impacted in how you show up, in how you communicate, in how you treat people, mm -hmm. in how you think and process the information coming at you. And so helping people to deal with their expectations and the narratives and the stories that they tell themselves about their experience mm -hmm. is the most liberating thing I can do. Yeah. To set people free to write their own story. Yeah. Because you can see what, when somebody does something to you, you can perceive it as this person stepped on my toes or this person kicked me in the shins. And how I receive that, it hurts the same. I'm the only one that's different. Mm -hmm. Whether they intended it or not, I can take up an offense or I can assume it wasn't meant to be an offense. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have a, an extraordinary grace for servers and people working in restaurants because I worked in restaurants for years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so it's super easy for me to put up with a waitress or a waiter or a server that's just having a rough day because I'm just like, yeah, that guy probably didn't tip and they, their kids spilled crap everywhere and mm -hmm. you're probably dealing with picky people who are sending the third plate back and totally get you. And it's so easy for me to find grace for those people because I know I've been there. Yeah, and I've experienced I've found myself at a place in life where I can find that with literally anyone. Yeah. I, I get you. I know, I know how that feels. Mm -hmm. 
because our experiences really aren't that different. Yeah, well, and, and whether we choose, uh, it's funny that you mentioned, like, you go into a situation, if you expect a negative outcome, then, you know, you do all of these things. But what we don't, or what people don't necessarily realize is, you can literally create the scenario that you're 100%. afraid of or concerned about just by having it in your brain. Absolutely. And so, like, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy mm -hmm. that not only are you, like, you thinking about it and agonizing over it, but you're actually creating it. Yeah. And then on top of that, if it wasn't that thing and you still have that in your mind, you can create it after the fact. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, somebody can have the best of intentions and you're like, screw that guy. He, he was totally coming for me. And you're like, uh, no. Actually, he was trying to help you out and was trying to be cool. But yeah. <laughs> but like, your lens put a different lilt on the colors. Exactly. Yeah. It's wild. Well, you guys are open to me taking a quick break. Sure. Of course. Cool. So this shit will keep recording and then we'll just uh, yeah. snap it. And Are you okay? My child. Oh yeah, my child like bladder is just hitting. Oh, <laughs> you tiny bladder man. Yes. My wife blames me every time she has to go pee. She was like, you did this to me. <laughs> I wasn't this way before two kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry. Sorry about that, honey. But not sorry. <laughs> it's funny. Our first official date, like... We had hung out a few times, and uh, our first official date, we had gone and run the St. Patty's Day Dash. And at yeah. the end of it, we went up into Kirkland. We were having lunch slash brunch at this breakfast counter up in Kirkland, and this woman was slammed. And it's St. Patrick's Day, and everybody's being rowdy. And it was so funny because he tells a story. He's like, you know, the, um, the woman comes to us, and she's totally flustered. And I looked at her, and I was like you doing like this seems rough you've got a lot on your plate like don't worry about us and like we're cool and he was just like no yeah it just blew his mind that was this one of our that first date thing at a, a <laughs> yeah. cafe you know? yeah oh, somebody else actually gives a shit about other people yeah it's amazing you want to do the snap again uh yeah we could probably just uh in case we want to line up the audio again here we go Click. Okay, yeah, I get that mic for you. Okay, so <clears throat> welcome back. Um, you introduced me to something else that was new. So um, obviously, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more at the end about uh, Fear Proof Me, how people might be able to track you down and chat. We'll get all your socials and all that sure. good stuff. Uh, the Wild Leaders. So yeah. you talked to me about this um, probably six, eight months before, and it was funny. Uh, I caught the hint of a, a religious undertone, and I was, at that point, very close-minded to it. And I was like, <laughs> thanks for thinking of me. I'll consider it in the future. And then, like I said, the, the fear thing came up for me. We talked about it a little bit more, and I was like, oh, okay, like, let's, let's check this out. So let's, uh, I've been to two sessions now of Wild Leaders. Uh, it is called Wild Leaders, yes. And what does Wild stand for again? Uh, Whole and Intentional Leader Development. And it's uh, Dr. Rob McKenna that runs it, yes? Correct. Um, so... Let's talk a little bit. Uh, how did you get tangled into Wild Leaders and Rob McKenna? Yeah, Dr. so McKenna? he's he's phenomenal. I when I finished my degree, I my plan was to go to grad school to study under him and be a part of his research because he's phenomenal. He's one of the most prominent voices in industrial and organizational psychology. Guy's amazing, brilliant, and went and even sat in on one of his classes a long time ago. And when I went to orientation. At SPU, they were like, "Yeah, we got some really exciting news. Dr. McKenna's leaving the program. <laughs> He's literally the only reason I was here. <laughs> I, I don't want to pay this for every year if he's not here." And uh, so I found out about Wild Leaders, and so I just I started joining their calls. It's free. It's on Fridays, and you can meet unbelievable leaders. And it's definitely not just a Christian event. It's that there are a lot of people there that are Christian. There are a lot of people there that are not Christian. There are a lot of people that have different faiths. But the idea is it's the opportunity for people to take their whole self into work. If you have faith, let that be a part of you. People shouldn't have to feel like they have to compartmentalize their identity to be accepted where they work. At all. In any way. Yeah. And so whole and intentional leader development, it ta they talk about how to be a good husband and a good parent and a good community person and how to, how to show up your best wherever you are, whatever you're doing, 
And there's people in academia, there's people from Hollywood, there's people from government, there's people from every sphere you can imagine, business leaders. And it's every time it's good, I don't care what the subject is, they always say in your breakout session, like, tell people why you came. And I, my answer is because I don't miss one. Like, if I'm at all possible, I'm going to be on these calls because you meet really random people from all over the world that have totally different backgrounds and, and are studying and researching and doing different things. And it's just phenomenal to meet people who they're humble enough to say, hey, I'm on a journey. I want to be a better leader. I want to learn what can I do that can make me more successful. How do I serve the people around me? How do I make them better? How do I raise the people around me so that we can all be more successful? And I, I've... That I've just loved every meeting we have. I've connected with a whole bunch of those people outside of the wild calls, become friends with them. I, uh, yeah, I was blown away to say the least. Um, you know, and I, I'm interested in exploring uh, the, like the wild toolkit, some of the yeah. other things they've talked about. Uh, obviously, I've got a, a number of projects going on right now, so I might have to pump the brakes a little bit, finish up a few projects before I jump into another. Um, we should get Dr. McKenna in here at some point to sit down with the four of us as well. I'd love to pick his brain more as well. It's uh, I definitely yes. encourage people to uh, go and search out. Um, let's uh, let's make sure that we get some information about the wild leaders, sure. and, and we'll post that on the, the bio for this this episode. And, and uh, if anyone listening knows Robert McKenna, other than I mean, I'm sure you can do it too. But talk him into coming on the podcast. Oh. <laughs> I imagine we can find a way to. Yeah. Convince Dr. McCanada. Mm -hmm. Come and have a chit chat with us. We have a few people on our list <laughs> that we're uh, interested in having you come talk to us. Well, yeah, I, that's kind of what I wanted to do today. Just like I wanted to explore the the conversation of fear and really uh, give people the opportunity to explore some of the work you've been yeah. doing. Yeah. Um, can you say something? Well, yes, I didn't want to interrupt. Balance, oh, please. Um, I would love to know um, how this journey has occurred for you like what yeah. what has it done for you and your family so the amazing thing is i wasn't looking for how to help me i was looking for how to help my wife mm -hmm. and in the process of trying to help my wife i realized how much help i needed <laughs> weird <laughs> how that works it was, it was in the service of others that i discovered wow i am really broken and i have a lot of really wrong expectations about myself others in the world around me and uh Aaron Beck created a thing called the Negative Cognitive Triad, where if you have a negative expectation about yourself and a negative expectation of the world around you, then it causes you to have a negative expectation of the future. And if you have a negative expectation of the future, it causes you to have a more negative expectation about yourself. And you get into this cycle mm -hmm. where unless you intentionally break the chain at some point and stop, you're just going to keep looking for things that prove yourself right. Yep. And the thing you were talking about, the self-fulfilling prophecy, cognitive dissonance is a real thing. Your brain can't hold two contradictory opinions at the same time. It, it forces itself to make one of those things more true than the other. You can't have someone be both completely evil and completely good. You can't have two opposite things. You have to accept one of these things has to be more true. And in fact, before we were recording, I was talking about my love for musical theater. Mm -hmm. There's an incredible story in Les Miserables where... Javert is faced with the idea that he has chased after Jean Valjean for all of these years, and he has assumed that this man is a criminal, he will always be a criminal, and he is all bad, all bad, all the time, forever. That's the way he is. And he comes to a place where Jean Valjean saves his life. He had every opportunity to take it, and he sets him free. And, and it comes to this place where it literally breaks Javert. He can't accept the fact that this man can be evil, and he's also the one that just saved my life. Yeah. And he literally has a mental break. Mm -hmm. I love, love, love the story of Lynn. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. <laughs> and I literally think if more people understood that true Christianity and faith looks more like the guy at the beginning of Les Mis, Jean yeah. Valjean, mm -hmm. gets caught stealing the silver, gets brought back by the cops, and... I don't, the minister or whatever yeah. basically says says oh of course those were a gift and let me give you even more that's what Christianity really looks like yeah mm -hmm. that's that, what it is to live for others I love 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 that about Christianity um, and I do I want people to you know really think the best of others mm -hmm. themselves 
Um, you know, if somebody's short and shitty with you, like, hey, maybe their parent is dying. Yeah. You know, maybe their car just got smashed. In the you know, they might just be having a moment. It might have nothing. In fact, it almost certainly almost. Almost. Yeah. has nothing to do with you. For sure. Um, yeah. And just giving people the grace and luxury. And you know what? There's no better way to help change somebody's situation than to be smile. You know, smile. Stick your hand out. Be yeah. nice. Be of service. Yeah. Uh, it's um, a beautiful message. I remember being, because I, like I said, I had no faith background. I didn't grow up reading the Bible or being around Christians. I remember being shocked that if you go back and you look at all of the people that Jesus interacts with, all of the people that he loves on, and all of the people that he rebukes, mm -hmm. the only people he rebukes are the religious zealots. Mm -hmm. yep. The only people he rebukes, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, he never rebukes a sinner. Mm -hmm. You'll never see him say, you're bad, you're horrible, that thing you did was... That doesn't happen once in the life of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Over and over, he tells the people, you're vipers, you're whitewashed tombs, you're, you're all of these things here. The people that get rebuked are never the people who are broken, hurting, and looking for help. It's all of the people who are self-righteous, mm -hmm. indignant, and think they've got it figured out, judging other people, pointing to... That's who Jesus rebuked. So just yeah. don't be that guy. Don't be a dick. That's really, it's a pretty simple lifestyle. Yeah. Well, and, and how do we manage to get people back to a place where they can see the good in other people and assume positive intent or just not negative intent and have all of this yuck going on? How do we, how do we get people back to that? More conversations. Well... That's why, That's why you're here. That's why you're here, buddy. <laughs> More talking. I had a, a really long conversation with a, a minister in the, the Midwest who he was uh, he was pushing a certain theology that was convincing people that their life was hopeless and that the system was going to hold them down and they were never going to be better. And we had a really long talk, and, and I said, you know, I, I know that there's there's systems that are broken, but if you convince everybody that it's hopeless, then having no hope isn't going to benefit them. You're asking the wrong question. Tell people, you know what, the system might be broken, ask the system. Mm -hmm. Rise about the system. Succeed in spite of the system. Because the fact is, there's broken systems everywhere. Yep. It doesn't matter where you're from. In our, in our, experience, excuse me, our experiences in Eastern Europe, like, the way people treat gypsies, they call them Roma now, it's not 1850s, or it's not 1950s America. It's 1850s America. They treat them like subhuman. And so when, you, when we were going over there and we are working with these people, we were having to treat people in the church like, no, God loves them. Like, you can't just kick them when you're walking down the street. You can't spit on them. You can't, you can't assume that they're subhuman. And at the same time, you have to work with road people and say, no, you're not a virus. <laughs> you're not an insect. You're not horrible. You have intrinsic value just by being here. Just the fact that you exist yeah. means you have value. Mm -hmm. And it was unbelievable to come back from seeing what, what real, systemic, incredible oppression looks like outside of America. And then come back and hear people being told, you can't succeed because of this. You can't, be, you, you can't rise above it. Everything's going to hold you back. And thinking... No, no, we have, you have no idea what real oppression yeah. looks like in the third world, mm -hmm. where they literally, and, and I don't want to be too graphic, but there was literally a story that was shared with me where people were giving birth, Roman people would, would give birth to a child that they would intentionally have so that they could sell. Wow. That's, that's commitment. Because there was just no value in life. Mm -hmm. There was no meaning. There was no purpose. It was just something that you endured. Yeah. I remember having a vision when we were over there one time, and it rattled me because I remember the first time I went trying to fight human trafficking thinking, because you'd hear these stories that there were parents who would sell their kids, and that was so outside of my paradigm that I couldn't fathom that. It, it, in my mind, you had to be evil to be willing to sell your child. Yeah. I couldn't accept that there was another solution. There was no other way to rationalize it. And we were at a meeting one time, and I was literally, it wasn't, there was no sermon going on, I was just quietly in prayer. And it felt like I watched a guy's life in fast forward. It was like catching snippets of this person's life, and I watched this young man, and I watched him meet a girl, 
I see them get married. I see their circumstances so bad that he's struggling to figure out how to survive. He thinks they may starve to death. She finds out she's pregnant and they give birth to a little baby girl. And he comes to a place where he realizes, if I don't sell her, I will watch her starve to death. If I sell her, she has a chance to live. Mm -hmm. And my mind was just blown. Like this, the people who are going through circumstances that we can't fathom come to conclusions we can't fathom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I, and again, it was very similar to, to meeting the local gunman and drug I, I got no judgment over people. Yeah. The people who do unthinkable things. Well, and if you're a real Christian, as I understand it, the judgment isn't up to you. <laughs> you know. Right. And quite frankly, that's probably my biggest problem with it is is unfortunate. You know, in any large organization, you've got some you've got some bad apples. So I need to focus on more of the positive sides of of, of the messaging because you know, really, I don't care how we get there. And I, ironically, I think we all agree the vast majority of humans, in you know, my experience, and I haven't been all over the world necessarily, and sure there are the outliers, but I think everybody wants their to be healthy to have their family, their children, their friends, their colleagues uh, be successful, to thrive, you know? And I feel like if everybody really spent their time focusing on wishing each other well and propping each other up, like, I don't care if it's Christianity, Muslim, yeah. whatever thing, special sauce, helps us all come together yeah. and be enlightened and recognize that, hey, we're a group of beings that are going to thrive together or die together. Like, yeah. Uh, I think it's a pretty obvious selection for most of us of how we'd like to, what the desired result would be. Well, uh, and to think about it from the perspective that we all are created from the same thing. We all are commingled energy at the end of the day. Like, we all started in the same place. And irrespective of whether, you know, I'm from Washington or Montana or you're from Yugoslavia or you're from Canada. Canada. We're all bold monkeys. <laughs> We're all bold monkeys. Laying on a tour I actually rock. am from Yugoslavia, as random as that really? pick was. Yes. Huh. Well, there you go. <laughs> well done, honey. Well yeah, done. Lady. You don't hear that country thrown out, considering yeah. it doesn't exist. Well done. <laughs> like, did you did research on JR ahead of time? I, I didn't know that. That's some I genealogy did. there. Woo. That's some geniusology there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can give you kind of a, an idea of how our six-week journey works. I think when people get an, an understanding of what we're working towards and how we work through the process, it really helps. Let's do it. So it started with, it's six weeks, and it's based on three psychological principles as well as three faith principles. So we say what we're doing with Fear Proof is helping people to identify, isolate, and overcome through faith wisdom work. Mm -hmm. And in the six-week journey, what we do is we alternate between those principles and we show how the process really is a holistic approach. So faith in week one, we talk about, another word you could use is just expectations. Like, what expectations do you have about yourself, others, and the world around you? Because those expectations are going to impact. They're the lens through which you are going to interpret all incoming data. Yep. So where, what are those beliefs? Where do they come from? Are those constructive? Are they destructive? Do you want to believe that going forward? Yeah. We go from faith and then we start to identify. And the things we're looking for are the triggers and the roots. The triggers are what's happening around me that's causing me to get into a fear experience. And then the root is what is that oftentimes lie that I'm telling myself about this experience that's giving fuel to the fire. Because it takes understanding both of those things. Oftentimes, people try and cover things with a Band-Aid and just deal with triggers. Yeah. If you just avoid the things that make you uncomfortable, it's never going away. Well, yeah. well and you live a small life. Yeah, it won't ever rectify itself. But it's also important to recognize those triggers because those triggers are the thing that start to help us build a custom process. Because at the end of the day, what we're doing is helping people create their own custom extinction experience. I can't tell anyone, here's how you're going to overcome your fear of anything. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. 
But what we help you do is get the tools so that you can figure out where are these lies that I've believed coming from? What are they based on? How did I come to these assumptions about the world and myself and others? How is that affecting the way I interact and the way I show up and the way I believe and speak and talk and treat people? And we go from faith is how we identify, wisdom is how we isolate, and wisdom is really getting to know yourself. Because oftentimes people will give, even to themselves, an automatic answer, but it's not really 100% the truth. And we really, you've got to peel the layers of the onion back to get, to get what's underneath there. And the one that's really common is everybody says that the biggest fear is public speaking. <laughs> no one's core fear is public speaking. <laughs> no one anywhere. It's, an, it's a first level that when you start to dig underneath, so, so why are you afraid of public speaking? We know we can rule it out because I can create a scenario where anybody's comfortable in a public speaking environment. If I put you in front of a huge group of first graders and your job is to count to 10 in your native language, nobody's going to be stressed about that. Like, okay, I can count to 10. There's no judgment from these people. They have no authority over me. They can't do anything to me. I can create a scenario. If all the people in your group are, are all people that love you and the thing you're talking about is the thing you're most interested in and they all think you're an expert and everybody's interested in what you have to say, all of a sudden you realize it's not the public speaking. There's something else behind it. And so we do a challenge, we teach people in week three, the so what challenge. So, so what? So that happens. What's the worst thing that? Okay, so, yeah. So you do go and you get up there and you public speak and people are like, well, what if I get up there and I don't know what to say? Okay. So you don't know what to say. You get up there and you make a total fool of yourself. You absolutely face plant. What happens after that? So what? Well, what if those people don't like me? Why do you need them to like you? Mm -hmm. Like, do you have inherent intrinsic value as a person that's not based on somebody else's opinion? Because if you have that, then you don't need them to like you. And you know that making a fool of yourself is something that people make an entire career out of. Yeah, they spend <laughs> decades of their life <laughs> making millions of dollars being an absolute fool. Mm -hmm. It's not that fair. We appreciate it. <laughs> That's <laughs> literally the first person I was thinking of, too. That's so funny. I was Jim Carrey. <laughs> That's oh, awesome. Fair enough. <laughs> I literally went to old school and him streaking naked <laughs> down the street. I was old school with Rose, yeah. Oh, man, that's no shame. I Free love the it. Tank. <laughs> yeah. so, so we help people start to dig back. Okay, so you, you're, you don't want people to dislike you. Okay, well, why do you need people to like you? Where is that coming from? And as you unpack it, you can get down to a place where you're like, well, you know what? I don't feel okay if somebody else doesn't validate me. Okay, well, now we're getting somewhere. Now we're starting to tap into some some real meat to where your fear is coming from. Who told you that you weren't valuable? Who told you that your value came from what you did or, or how you performed or what the experience was of others? And so we go from identifying is, and then we work in the isolation point, which is where we really drill down to it's the scenario like my wife. It's at home and a sound happens and we can't immediately identify it. And so the isolation process is where you really drill down to these are the factors and we help people. You can actually do a process of visualization where you put yourself back in your fear inducing experience and you start to change aspects of the scenario. You know, if I was there and this person was there with me, I wouldn't have been afraid. Or if this person wasn't there, or if I had that experience, but I was in a different place, I was at home instead of at work, or you start playing with this scenario in your mind and your heart's going to react the same way. You're still going to, you can trigger a fear response and you can feel it and you can know it. And we help people to identify how does your body manifest fear? Because it's different for everybody, but the way it does it for you is the way it does it for you. And so for some people, your mind may race, or your palms get sweaty, or your heart races, or you, I, I get a real shrinking feeling in my chest, or people's shoulders get tight, or whatever it is. That's how your body processes it. And so when people start to become more aware of their experience, <clears throat> excuse me, their experience, they can start to recognize, you know, I was getting in a fear experience, but I didn't even know it. And they live in this low-level, simmering fear, expectation of bad, and it causes people to live in mediocrity because it's safer than the danger of facing whatever that thing is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we work on wisdom is how we overcome over the last two weeks. And wisdom is, okay, how do I create a plan where I can aggressively face all of these things that I now recognize are the components? This is the recipe to the secret sauce how do I create a plan for facing these things in a safe way, with safe people? We teach people the process of recognizing it's really crucial to be able to 
to process your experience in a way where you take your short-term memory, encoding it as long-term memory in a way that's adaptive. Because other than that, it's just a crapshoot. If you're not intentionally making the short-term memory and long-term memory in a, in a successful way, it may or may not be helpful for you. Mm -hmm. So there's an intentionality in how do we create this plan and then overcome is week six. And that's, okay, we're going to go do this plan and this process that we've developed to face the very specific things that are attached to the expectations that we've created about ourselves, others, and the world around us so that we can create a situation where I can go into what was previously a fear-inducing experience, and maybe I don't, I don't, it's not that you never feel fear, and in fact, you said at the beginning, like, if I'm getting chased by a rabid dog, I want fear. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want oxygenation to kick in. I want my fast-switch muscle reflexes to kick in. I want a, all of the things that come with it, because I need that in that moment. Yep. The problem is, when all of those things happen because your boss walked in the room, or you're <laughs> or trying your to run a in town. Yeah. <laughs> When you have those visceral experiences and you can recognize the level of experience I'm having versus what's really going on, they don't match. And when you see that discrepancy, that every time is the emotional memory of your past intruding into the present. And so it's time to recognize. If you have a really serious response because the car in front of you slammed on its brakes and you freak out for a second... That's totally the way fear is supposed to work. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what we want. And so that's why people have been like, oh yeah, you do that fearless thing. And I'm like, no, I don't want people fear to do fearless. Fear doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. I don't want, and it's not even a good thing. Like if you genuinely have no fear, you are probably so far down the sociopath scale that you have much bigger problems. We all have it. It's there. It's just whether you acknowledge it and are willing to face it. Because if you can, see, I've got this, and it's something I want to work on, you can get on the other side. If you're in denial, if you refuse to accept that it's there, if you're pretending, if your ego and your masculine sense of self requires you to be perfect and stoic, because that was me, it's a huge block. I mean, I remember growing up thinking, essentially, all emotions other than anger were inherently the feminine emasculinating experience. And I was not allowed to experience those things, feel those things, honor those things. And so anger just becomes a mask for everything. Like I'm okay being angry. I'm okay with rage. I just can't be sad. Sure as fuck can't cry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Yeah. No, I've cried more in my later years than I ever did. <laughs> oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. That sounds powerful as hell. You said eight years you've been working yeah. this now. Over eight years we've been teaching this course. Very cool. And, the, and one of the most amazing things about it is it, it doesn't matter. Every socioeconomic background, cultural background, age, race, faith, doesn't matter. It works universally because it's not a system that says do these things and you'll get over it. It's here's how you figure out what's going to work for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you reframe. It's... I can't fix anyone, but I can show you how to help yourself figure out what's going wrong and create a new normal, a new expectation, a new way of seeing the world. Creating possibilities. Oh, I love it. It's spectacular. It's incredibly powerful. Yeah. Well, JR, this has been free and spectacular. I'm really excited. I, uh, I uh, am looking forward to exploring your program myself at some point in the future. Uh, definitely interested in doing more work with the wild leaders and mm -hmm. maybe running into Dr. Rob McKenna at some point. you have any uh, closing thoughts? Or? Well, and there's something on the horizon that's exciting, too. We're working on a new project that's called Work Courage, and we're taking into the work sphere all of the stuff that we've been doing in a personal realm for many years and helping people realize how the negative expectation of an outcome influences motivation theory, groupthink, team dynamics, Goal setting. Mm -hmm. All of the things that you're doing in work, your negative expectations are impacting you just the same way. Yeah. And so we're creating a corporate version called Work Courage. And the first thing that I'm doing, because I don't have my own PhD, because I'm not doing my own research, I'm taking the gift that I do have, which is I have the ability to read these ridiculously obnoxious, heady journals <laughs> and help decipher them and make them much more accessible. Mm -hmm. And so what we're going to start doing is we're going to start looking into, and in fact, the funny thing is I decided what my first topic was before the whole world went the direction it did. 
And so job insecurity is the first thing that we're addressing. We're looking into the research around job insecurity, and then tech companies everywhere just start laying off tens of thousands See, of people. See, you did it. I know. <laughs> Creating possibilities is screwing everybody up, JR. Damn it. <laughs> How dare you. So we're, we want to we wanna help people in the work sphere recognize, man, I've got these expectations about my boss and my coworkers and my projects. And like, I think one of the most powerful things we do is help people to recognize that failure is only a failure if you didn't learn anything from it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So many people, and especially this next generation, have been taught that if you do one thing wrong, if you fail, if you say the wrong thing, you are canceled. Your rest of your life is, is now marred by that. You can never succeed. You can never move forward. This defines you. And we want to help people recognize that any time a plan of yours doesn't work, but you learn what not to do next time, your failed plan became a successful lesson. Mm -hmm. True that. And we can't make everything work. Nobody's going to have every plan work out. Yeah. It's never going to happen. <laughs> Where did we get this impression that we had to be perfect at everything? Like, it's the most ridiculous crap I've ever heard of, and I fall prey to it all the time. <laughs> yeah, like you said earlier, you know, it's about having these conversations. We've just got to be able to, like, be humans and sit down and talk about this because, look, the past is the past, and, you know, we can look at it and learn from it and move forward. And You're not changing it. Light. But, yeah, it's like what's done is done, and, like, beating yourself up about it is... Kind of a wasted effort. Learn well, a lesson and move forward. And beating other people up about it is also <laughs> equally as useless. And, you know, if we can't see the good in other people, like... Just... Well, I think that's one last little important point there, too, is, uh, you know, through your, your graciousness, the way that you've said, you know, I, you know, I didn't judge this drug running, you know, whatever, like, I would have been that person in that environment. Giving people that grace and holding space, you know, I grew up as a high-functioning alcoholic fuckboy. My wife gave me the opportunity and the space to occur as someone different. It's shocking how suddenly when somebody gave me the opportunity to be seen differently, I jumped right to the challenge. But, yeah. you know, my whole life before that, I couldn't be anybody else because nobody was interested in seeing me any other way. Yeah. It's incredibly powerful and transformative. So I love the work that you're doing, brother. I'm excited to check it out myself. I'm hoping some of our guests will uh, come and explore it with you as well. And uh, we'll have to, once you launch this new program, I'd love to get you back to, to chat mm -hmm. about that. And, yeah. you know, I, uh, we are connected with some companies as well that could certainly uh, use, use some help with some of the, the folks on their teams. So mm -hmm. ourselves as well. Well, and everybody brings their story to the story, right? True that. So... You know, if we can just purify the message a little bit and let it be what it is and not add extra crap to it. Yeah. We can all evolve together. <laughs> That's the hope. Alrighty, folks. Well, thank you much for uh, being here with us, JR. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Really appreciate it. A joy just to get to connect with you. Again. Yeah, dude, it's been too long. I'm uh, excited to, to be doing more of this and seeing more of you. It's it's quite the uh, the joy. It's quite different than when we were in high school. So. Very different. <laughs> oh my goodness! But the hug was the same. It's true. It's wow. true. That was beautiful to see. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you much. Stay elevated. Make everybody better. Love y'all. Take care.